Um, I did want to talk about a few little things I wanted to mention to you about dialogue before we get into some of this other stuff. I don't think I've done this um, yet, so let's just give you, I want to give you some clues on writing your manuscript in a way that will immediately make it look professional, okay? Uh, the first one is that, tell me if I've talked about this, because I'm pretty sure I have it. If you're doing your, um, your block of text, your dialogue, This is not usually as, um, as, uh, as preferable as as this. Okay. Now I don't know if you can um, if you can make that out with all the squiggles in it, but this one is. I went to the store and bought some food. It was good food. Um, and then on the way home, I got in a car wreck. I'm sorry, honey. Karen said. Okay. As opposed to I went to the store. Karen said. And I bought some, um, some of this and some of that, but on the way home, I'm, I got in a car wreck. I'm sorry, honey. Meaning, putting your attribution at the end is worse than putting it near the beginning. The reason for the... Yes? Uh, actually, just a question. Is yes. that... Uh, do you want to do that just about every time? You or? want to do that every time. Every time it's humanly possible to put this early, do it. The reason being that your reader will be scanning this whole paragraph waiting to find out who said it. And until they have the context of who said it, they're going to gloss over naturally a lot of this information and then find out who said it and then go back and reinterpret it. And essentially you're making them read the same sentence twice. Either that or they're going to um, keep on going and miss the context. Okay? So, the first reasonable place, the first reasonable break, um, sometimes you can go a full sentence because it'll be a short sentence, it's not compound, but the first place you can, even, and, and, you know, if there's an address, hey Derek, put, put it right after that. Um, get it as soon as you can, and in fact, if you're going to have this big block and there's not a good place for it, put a beat right in front. front. Travis? Um, in a situation where it doesn't require, hopefully, an attribution. Yes. Could we just leave it out entirely? I mean, even yeah. if it is somewhat long, then just leave yeah. it out entirely? Yeah, could, yeah. as long as um, the, the, the main place you're going to not need an attribution is um, if you've got a dialogue between two people and you've already established who's talking. Um, this works particularly well if you're good at dialogue. And that means pe what people say are distinctive is distinctive. Um, and people can keep it straight. You can actually have a much better sequence without using the tags um, if, if you know what you're doing. But if there are three people in conversation, you basically have to use the tags always, unless one is a direct answer to the other. You know, if I said, we were, we were all having a conversation and Travis asked me a question, I said, well, Travis, um, that, that is going to follow well enough that you probably don't need the attribution there. Um, and leaving it out, you know, attributions are invisible. Keep this in mind. The brain interprets the, the said and the asked really quickly and then, um, and then gives context, which means that you can err on the side of putting in more attributions if you want to. So would you recommend just saying things like said, asked? So next not, point, not we'll get to it, we'll get to it. I want to get this down first and then we'll get to that. Um, so, this is what we call a beat. A beat is showing what someone does <coughs> alongside their dialogue, okay? And so, if you have the, the paragraph start with Karen Grimace, you don't actually then need any attribution, okay? In fact, you usually want to leave one out because you've already, you already have one. On line with this, anytime someone does something that's short enough, you know, a, a sentence or two, and then they speak, put them all in the same paragraph, It'll follow directly for the reader's mind if someone does something and then talks. Um, splitting it into paragraphs is usually, not always, but usually a bad idea. Um, Karen walked over to the, uh, to the chair. And if you put on the next paragraph, her talking, the reader's immediately going to assume that went to another person because they're going to interpret her walking to the chair as a beat. And then the next line of dialogue they're going to interpret as, her, as hers, unless it's on the next line, where assume, they're going to assume it went to somebody else. Okay? So mastering this, which is really easy to master, 
helps the flow of your dialogue a whole lot. Okay? Keep things on the same paragraph when you can. Use the attributions as early as possible. Alternate between, um, between uh, beats, um, the attributions. A couple of points. Number one, don't use too many beats. Um, I'm guilty of this sometimes myself. The thing is, if you modify every sentence in a dialogue, it gets really annoying to the reader and it slows it down. If every sentence somebody's doing something, so you're giving a, 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 an expression every sentence. If you're telling, you know, what's going on so that frequently, your reader has trouble focusing on the dialogue and, and that's the point of the sequence. Now that's not to say you shouldn't have people doing things during dialogue, you should. Um, but I would say try and keep your, your descriptions of what's going on. Have a little flurry of conversation, a back and forth, three or four um, back and forths. And then get into what someone's doing. Do another little flurry with maybe one or two beats in there, advancing what's going on, and then give a little bit more description. Hey, I think there's uh, actually a seat right over there. There's two of them. Um, so... Just decide what your personal flow is going to be. There is no absolute right way or wrong way to do this, but be aware that you don't need as many beats. The thing about a person's mind when they start jumping into dialogue is they switch to dialogue mode. And in dialogue mode, they just start looking at this stuff. In fact, they start ignoring the beats except to see who's doing, um, who, who's involved and who's saying what. And they'll, they'll pick up some cursory, cursory information from the beat, but unless you transition them out with a few paragraphs of description, they're going to stay in dialogue mode, and a lot of readers are going to skip all the other stuff you put alongside your dialogue. So keep it short and quick alongside the dialogue, and you will find your dialogue sequences work a lot better. Okay? Yes? Did you say that like, as a class you tend to lean more one way? I see um, a little too much of this. Um, I've mentioned to some of you that your dialogue's really good. Often I'm meaning you're doing all of this stuff well. Um, either that or I'm meaning, I usually try to tell you. Uh, otherwise I'm meaning your voice is good for your characters and it feels natural. Um, but, um, but I would say I'm seeing a bit of this. This is normal um, for newer writers. I did a lot more than I used to. Um, I, I used to do a lot more than I do now. I still think I do it a little too much. Um, if you look for really great dialogue writers, like Terry Pratchett, he's a genius at dialogue, you will find that his beats are really, really used very, very sparsely um, in order to keep that flow of the dialogue moving really well. He's great at it. Um, there are others. Do you guys want to throw out any others, people that you think that are really good at dialogue? <coughs> Nothing comes to mind. All right. Um, Wasn't Scott Kyer? I think he's pretty good. Scott's pretty good. Yeah, he is. Um, and you'll see he uses he uses even less. He, he goes way far in the um, the not using beats for here in his later books. If you go look at like the uh, the Ender Shadow books, boy, it's, he'll have pages of just the dialogue um, with some with some attributions and things. But he'll make sure everyone's talking in a distinctive <coughs> way. And you know you can go pages and not even have to notice what the um, what the what the different attributions are. He goes a little bit far for me. Um, I read epic fantasy. I do prefer to have a little bit more thickness to some of my books, but it's an interesting exercise to read some of those. He does a, a fantastic job with it. So, um, the other item to mention with this is the thing we call said bookisms. I don't know where this term came from, but it's the um, my it's my editor's term for it. So I just started using it. I don't even know how universal it is. Um, but the said bookisms are all the things you use instead of said. Um, and newer writers, one dividing line between newer writers and more experienced writers, is newer writers tend to use a ton of said bookisms, and more experienced writers tend to move away from it naturally, is what we've found. Um, the reason for this being most writers uh, uh, don't, it's either other writers give it to them as advice, but I think it's also something natural you start to realize is that all of this stuff is invisible, and you want it to be invisible most of the time. Um, and so anything you use something here instead of said, it draws the reader's attention and focus away from the dialogue and to the non-dialogue stuff, and actually shifts them out of the dialogue reading mindset in the middle of the dialogue, which is a bad thing. 
Um, now, once in a while, you do want something here that shifts them out and, um, and adds extra punctuation to the sentence. Um, screamed is going to be different than said. Now, a lot of hardcore anti-said bookism um, authors will say, just put an exclamation point and italics, and the context should say that they're screaming, and you should never have to write that they screamed. I don't go that far. Um, I do try to keep myself to using these infrequently, um, meaning once every five or six times. I don't count them, but that's what I really strive for. If I look through and notice I'm using them too often, um, then, then that can be a problem. One of the other things to realize here is that some other things, other than said, are going to be invisible to you that are not invisible to other people. They become invisible to you because you use them so frequently that they just feel like said to you, commented. Um, is like this. Some people use it so often that it just becomes said to them. And so they're, they're like, Brandon, it's, why do you mean it's drawing people out? But the thing is, for a lot of people, that's not invisible. It's different enough than said that they're stopping just that for a fraction and reading that word when you don't actually want them reading that word. Because a lot of time when we're reading, we're not actually reading. We're not looking at the words. We're interpreting with our brains. And this is the mode that you actually want people to get into. They're paying attention to what's going on. They're getting sucked into the story. You don't actually want them stopping and reading your said bookism most of the time. Um, but mentioning ask is invisible for most people. Asked is usually going to be invisible, and um, most of the time, even the hardcore anti-set book is going to say you can use these two pretty interchangeably as long when you're asking a question. I heard somebody say uh, after somebody has ask on there, then mm -hmm. they um, have on the next one they would put replied rather than putting said. I hate replied mm -hmm. because you're already doing it. That's the thing. As soon as it happens, you're giving the reply after the reply has happened. Um, that's a personal thing of mine. I don't think you almost ever need it. Um, I used to use it a lot, though. Um, but it comes down to this, why use it on it? Why show something and then tell it to us? And a lot of these are tells. A lot of them are. Um, even screamed is a tell. Um, I use screamed, I use whispered, I use a fair number of these. J.K. Rowling uses them all over the place, and she's a fantastic writer. So this isn't a hard, fast rule. You're going to have to decide for yourself. But if you're using them, use them because you intentionally say, I subscribe to the theory that this is good for my writing, knowing that about 90% of professional writers disagree vehemently with this. OK? Um, and most editors do as well. If you use a lot of these in your first page, the editor is going to look at you as an amateur. Um, if you are hardcore on the I like these, I would still suggest in your opening um, paragraphs, use only said and asked if you're, set, if you're saying to an editor. Maybe, you know, some things like screamed or, you know, some of these yelled or shouted or stuff like that um, once in a while. But try to get away from using any of them. It'll make you look more professional. And after the fact, you can go to them and say, hey, I like these more. Can we have a conversation about it and see where your editor stands on it and that sort of thing. Okay? This is... Um, this is a hard one for a lot of writers to get into because in, um, in grade school and secondary school, we're taught to be creative, you know, use your thesaurus, um, and we're, we're taught to explore, and so we start using a different word every time, thinking we're really creative, um, not realizing that in actual storytelling, the way that storytelling works, these, these things are hurting you.